Welcome back, everyone. This is Susie Moser with the second part of Unit 1, um, in which we want to talk about the basics of strategic climate change communication. Um, I'm using the term strategic interchangeably with impactful or effective climate change communication here. And what I mean by that is simply that the communication actually has the intended effect and impact that you want to have, as opposed to no impact at all or some unintended consequence. So what does it take? Um, what we want to cover in this particular part of Unit 1 is um, to think about communication not just as delivering information, but as about connecting with people. I'll say a lot more about that. And I guess to set up the whole rest of this training, I want to use an example to show you what are the potential problems or challenges that effective climate change communication must address. I'm going to use an example from the US where you know the research is, is pretty well established and we have good information. And as I mentioned to you in the first part of this unit, um, explore whether that is true for you as well. Whether that holds in the Seychelles or maybe there's other explanations. I'd be really curious to learn from you about that. Um, but really what this will show us that is that communication is really not just about reaching people's head. <laughs> it's not just a cognitive or educational problem. It is really something that we need to address at the psychological, social, cultural and political level and you know that's what we will do for the rest of uh, this entire course i'm going to introduce you to the very fundamentals of um, strategic communication and we're going to introduce here only a step-by-step -step process of how to develop a communication strategy that is effective um, but we'll really implement that step-by-step um, -step process throughout the rest of the training. And then I'll end this particular piece with just a brief outlook to what we'll do in Unit 1. So before we get anywhere, <laughs> I want to make sure that you have had a chance to actually do Exercise 2, which is simply to listen to Dr. Daniel Itongo's three lectures, each one about 15 minutes long, to just get the basics on the science of climate change, the impacts, and the solutions. And as I said before, if you feel really confident um, in those fundamentals, then you, know, you, you don't need that necessarily for the substance, for the content, um, but you might very well, um, and I'm really suggesting strongly that you do listen to it to see how does Daniel communicate this? Is it effective? What does it achieve? What could it achieve? Um, and what would be your suggestions um, of how to do it differently, better? Daniel wants your feedback later and we will discuss that during our Zoom meeting. So if you haven't done that yet, please um, take a break and listen to those three brief lectures um, and then come back to this and just pick it up right here. One of the things you will hear I hope you hear is in part one in his first lecture the science about climate change is actually incredibly well established it's clear and compelling we know that this is happening and we know it's human caused that's the message you get from that first message from that first uh, lecture in the second one really what Daniel does is make a really rational case for why it's sensible to act on it, to avoid further problems from climate change by showing us what could happen and what already does happen with examples from your own back backyard, what is happening uh, in your own backyard. And then the third lecture is focused on the possible solutions and you know, it, it essentially tells us that there are actually things we can do, both to reduce the problem from the front end, what we you know, is addressing the causes that we call climate mitigation or greenhouse gas emission reductions. And we can also do a whole number of things to prepare for the impacts and to reduce those impacts, to minimize them as much as possible or possibly even take advantage of some of the new opportunities that it brings. That's what we call adaptation. So the science is clear. It's rational and sensible to act now to avoid 
the problems or further problems, and there is actually something we can do. Part of exercise two, besides listening to those lectures, is that I'm asking you to go out into your environment, into nature, into your neighborhoods, and see if you can see any of these things happening. Can you observe impacts? Is there a coastal stretch that's eroding? Are there, you know, people with solar roofs on their on their houses? Those are the things that I want you to do. Um, look in the Google folder, Unit 1, Exercise 2, after listening to these lectures and look at um, those examples in your own neighborhood and reflect on it, see what happens, see how you feel about it. One of the things that I just find amazing is that a set of le lectures like this doesn't seem to be enough to get us to act. And many of you in your pre-training surveys have said as much. You said, why do people not care? How come we're not getting anybody to act on this, or at least not enough people to act on this? It is it, it truly, there must be something else um, that, that is missing or that we need to do on top of it. So often <laughs> we face this problem here of, you know, taking, speaking louder than ever and trying to get through to people and they just don't care. So many of you mentioned that. So what is it? How do we get people to care? I want to start this by bringing to you a, a saying, um, almost like a, and I don't know if it's, it's really a, an established saying, but I got it from a Dutch source where people said, when something is said, it's not necessarily heard. When it's heard, it's not necessarily understood. When it's understood, it's not necessarily agreed. And even the things that are agreed are not necessarily implemented. Think about that. Our communication does not necessarily mean we're going to act on it. Through all these steps of hearing, understanding, agreeing, and then doing. Right? So that is the challenge that effective communication has to address. It has to overcome every one of these hurdles. How do we do that? This is this challenge of overcoming these hurdles is why I think this is far more complicated than just getting the right information out. Because what if we get the right information out, the right message? It might be heard, it might not be understood, <laughs> it might not be agreed, and certainly people don't necessarily act on it, right? So this is why what I'm gonna do here in this training is not about one-way information delivery, but encourage you to get into a form of engagement that allows you to deeply interact with your audience to overcome each of these hurdles step by step through dialogue, through interaction, and so on. So it's really, this is what we need to work on. And this is what this training focuses on. I wanna start with a definition of what communication actually means. Communication comes from the Latin word um, communicare, which actually has the same root as the word communion, which means to impart, to share, to make common. Think about that for a moment. Bill McDonough says communities are groups of people communicating. Groups of people who are making things common to each other. That is how I want you to understand from now on what communication is about. It is about creating common ground with whoever you speak with. And sometimes that could be difficult, right? Because not everyone agrees with you. But somehow what we need to do is to create that kind of connection with each other. Many of you in your pre-training surveys have said to you, have said to me, what you really want is to get people to pay attention 
to get through with a message, to get them to care, and you get them to do something. So this is exactly like that Dutch um, poem or, or saying that I mentioned earlier. So many of you felt like, well, people are just not paying attention or caring about this. So what I want to do here is give an example from the US where it was exactly that same assumption of, you know, is it the problem that Americans just don't care? Is that really what's going on? Because if we were to care, right, as the saying goes here, we could change the world. But if we don't care enough, well, then maybe we don't get there. Also notice caring is not a heady concept. Caring is about the heart. Caring is about emotion. It's about connecting with something very deep. So is that what's going on? Let's look at the, some of the data from this American example, okay? What I wanna to introduce to you here is a really interesting uh, series of studies conducted by my colleague and friend, Tony Lizarowitz. He's at Yale University um, and he works with colleagues at George Mason University and others and he has come up with this concept or this notion that there isn't just one American public, but there is in fact six American publics when it comes to global warming. He has named them the people who are alarmed, people who are concerned, people who are cautious about it, people who are disengaged, they just are not paying attention, people who are doubtful, and then some that are outright dismissive. And you can see on this spectrum at the bottom here that the alarmed on that side of the spectrum, those are the people who absolutely believe climate change, global warming is happening. They're deeply concerned. They're most motivated to do, take action, appropriate action. And then on the other end of the spectrum are those who, you know, not only don't believe in global warming, they're actively working against anybody doing anything. They certainly are not concerned that this is anything to worry about. Now, Tony has studied Americans since 2004, every single year, more than twice, I think two times a year, he has basically done a nationally representative survey to see, you know, where do these American, how many people do we have that fall into the group of the alarm, the concern, the cautious, and you know, the rest of them. And I'm gonna show you here just one, um, one result from the most, well, it's the most recent one that's available from December, 2018. It's a little while ago, the latest is not yet out, but it's a really interesting one in that it shows for the first time that the alarmed and the concerned are making up the majority of American people. Now, they vary a little bit in the degree to which they worry about this issue, as you, you know, as I just explained, but there is not one belief about this. About a third are alarmed and another third are concerned. And then the, you know, the rest of them are cautious, disengaged, doubtful, or outright dismissive. There was a time when the dismissive and the doubtful were the majority of Americans. That's no longer the case. So what I want you to keep in mind and what I'm talking about in the next few slides is this distribution of opinions across the American public, not one public, six publics. Look at the bottom, you see those same six publics again from the alarm to the dismissive. What he found in his research is that how much attention these different publics pay to the issue of global warming. It's what he calls issue in involvement and you can see it here with the red line. So look at that, the alarmed are totally involved in this issue, highest of any of them. They're willing to you know, take in information carefully. They're predisposed to actually accept it and to respond to the information. And then it drops off rather radically all the way to the ones who are disengaged, which you know, get their name because they don't pay attention to the issue. Um, and then interestingly enough, the doubtful and the dismissive are more engaged on this, except they're engaged in just the opposite direction, right? They pay attention because they so dislike um, what's going on. They're, they're not likely to change their beliefs. They just want to counter argue. And in fact, they're, they're motivated to just debate it and dismiss it. Um, 
but they're not nearly as engaged um, as the alarmed on the other end of the spectrum. Attitudinal valence is a related concept which basically just you know says something about how much they're inclined to want to believe that you know if you communicate to them about the seriousness of climate change, the alarmed will believe you, the dismissive won't. That's essentially what this means, right? So just think about that. How much easier would it be to communicate with the alarmed and the concerned compared to the disengaged? who you might not even reach versus the ones who are just waiting to argue with you, <laughs> right? So one possible explanation for why Americans don't care is that some care and then four or five other groups are on a whole different end of the spectrum. It's just not simply um, that simple to, to, you know, to basically think that it's just about caring. It's a much more complex issue. Here's a second or maybe a different part of the same explanation, which is look at the competition. Um, in this instance here, they basically put the, um, the six Americas along a spectrum. And essentially, you know, there's a very large overlap between how um, the more liberal end is the alarmed and the, the concerned and then the more conservative end of the political spectrum in this country is on the other side, the dismissive and the doubtful. And look at where global warming falls in terms of the importance it has to people, you know, people's political decisions, people's uh, interests and concerns. For the liberals, for the, you know, alarmed and, and uh, concerned ones, environmental protection, healthcare, global warming, clean energy, it's right up there. They're just waiting for you to talk about it. When you get further down into, you know, the, the middle of the spectrum, well, it the global warming is number seven, and then it's number 23. <laughs> and for the conservatives, it's the bottom of the, the barrel. So just imagine how much harder it is to get through to people if they don't even care, if they don't even, you know, there's like 25 other things ahead of the issue that they want to hear about, right? So part of the issue is that there is a huge competition of what is more import important to people this, in this instance here, it's, you know, which of the factors influence people's uh, election uh, choices, their uh, preferred presidential candidate. But you can see how, you know, <laughs> it, it's very, very different um, for how important this issue is. Here's another possible ex explanation, and that is um, looking at the prevailing social norms. Let me explain what I mean by that. So most people, you know, who don't hear from you or from anybody, from a scientist directly, they basically look to a friend. They look to their family members to see what do they think, right? And as we all do, um, this is a very common phenomenon for uh, issues that we are not expert on. We look for the people that we trust. And who do we trust the most? Family and friends. Not necessarily the experts, that comes in in some instances, but very often we simply look to, what does my brother do? What does my uncle do? What does my you know, grandma think? <laughs> um, and so here in this particular graphic, what you see is that um, as for the importance to family and friends, um, only 6% of the people asked think that global warming, climate change is really, really important, extremely important to their family and friends. The green ones are, you know, the ones where they think it is of some importance to people, whereas the gray zone is they either don't know or they didn't give a response. And then the yellow brownish uh, colors are where the respondents don't believe it's much of an issue. It's not of an uh, importance. So they might think it is important to them, but not, I mean, there's about half of, not even half of the people think that it's important. And so if it's not important to my family, to my friends, why should it be important to me? And the same is, you know, on the issue, that we call, the, something we call the descriptive norm, but it's really what we think, how much effort our family and friends make to act on this information. And here the situation is even 
you know, less uh, in, uh, encouraging because most people do not think that their family and friends make much of an e effort. So if they don't, why should I? Social norms, prevailing social norms, either by what we think how important it is or whether people actually make an, what, when we think people make an effort to act on it, is one of the most important clues as to whether or not we think we should do something ourselves. So if others don't act, it's very unlikely that you're gonna convince them that they should start acting. We'll come back to this issue throughout this, um, this course. It's really important to think about what are the prevailing social norms? What do people see? Now, here's a third explanation, and that has to do with the lack of political engagement. <laughs> It's a really interesting one, too. Um, in this instance, people were asked, how willing or unwilling would you be to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action to reduce global warming? Less than half of Americans, 35% only, thought that they either participate now, definitely would participate, or probably might maybe participate in such an action. <laughs> Only 35, right? Three out of 10, essentially. There's a little bit more for Demo Democrats um, and for particularly for liberal Democrats, whereas, you know, for independents, the middle of the spectrum and the more conservative end of the political spectrum, they hardly even participate in the process. So this political conviction and whether or not people actually act is a possible other explanation for why we don't see action. Stay on that. Look at this one here. It goes right together with the, with the last slides. Um, in this particular instance, people were asked, how confident are you that people like you working together could actually influence certain actors? In this instance, the, the first one is affect what local businesses do in the local community what local government does, what state government does, what corporations do, and what the federal government does. It reflects obviously our um, governance system here and you know, it might be slightly different for you in terms of how you organize, but really what you're seeing here is that when things are closer to home, the local businesses and local government, people have some sense that they might influence them, but the further f removed the actors are from the person being asked, the less sense of influence do people have. Again, the same pattern is that Democrats and the, particularly the, the most liberal um, left-leaning uh, in the political spectrum think they have the greatest um, amount of influence. And then when you go down to the conservative end, the Republicans, they feel like it just basically makes no difference to, to you know, do anything. It just simply won't make a difference. So if that's what people think, that their actions won't make a difference to the outcome, why should they get off the couch? Right? So that's a really important piece. How much do people experience a sense of what we call political efficacy, a sense that they can make a difference in the political process? There's another piece to this, and I want to um, sort of, you know, explore that in, with you a little bit in, in uh, going through this exercise or this particular slide together. In this case, people were asked which of these statements comes closest to their view. The first one is that the largest number of Americans believe that humans could reduce global warming, but it's unclear at this point whether they will do what's necessary. It's simply doubt. You know, we could, but maybe we won't. That's a lot of people who think that way. If you have so little, you know, optimism that you could make a difference or that you collectively could make a difference, it's really important to, to think about that. The next group, next biggest group is rather cynical, I would say. Um, they believe that humans could reduce global warming, but people aren't willing to change their behavior so we're not going to, right? It's, it's rather having given up on 
on humans altogether. The next biggest group, humans can't reduce global warming even if it's happening. It's a rather fatalistic view and no small proportion either. And then there's that smaller portion of people who is simply denying that there is an issue to go, you know, going on anyway, so why bother doing anything? Um, but look at this. Only 6% believe that humans can reduce global warming and we're going to do so successfully. 6%. That's less than one finger on your hand. <laughs> That's the sort of attitude. I wonder if you did something like this and you asked these same questions in Seychelles, where, where would people come down? Where do you think things are? Something maybe to reflect on in a journal. Here's another possible explanation. And, and that one is that it actually has something to do with the underlying worldviews. Let me explain to you first about these worldviews and then I show you how these six Americas um, feature along these. So one worldview is that Earth's climate is very stable, global warming will have little or no effect. You know, you can push the system a little, but it's it's just stable. It's not we can't push it over the um, over the edge. There's another worldview that thinks the world is completely random. No matter what you do, it like how it's going to respond is is entirely unpredictable. Now think about it for those two particular worldviews. If that is what people deeply believe in the in the core of their beings, why should they get on board with doing anything about climate change? Either it makes no difference because the system is stable and the other one is whatever I do, it doesn't make any difference, right? The next one is that the world is incredibly fragile. The slightest thing and it will tip into a different state or, you know, it will have abrupt and catastrophic effects. Another really prevalent worldview is that, oh, all these things are gradual, slow changes, not too much to worry about, we can adjust to it. Certainly, you know, the dangerous effects are a long way off. It's 100 years from now, <laughs> right? We all have heard these. And the last one is that, you know, the world is sort of stable for a while, and then beyond a certain tipping point, maybe it crosses some threshold and we get bigger changes. So maybe we need to do a little something to keep it or prevent the worst from happening further out. But, you know, right now it's OK. So these are the possible worldviews that were investigated in this particular question. Now look how the different Americas, the six Americas, fall across. In the first instance, the, the alarmed, um, they do not have a prevalence of this stable or random worldview, whereas they think much more about it's gradual or the, there are, there are, uh, you know, the earth is fragile and we you know, must really prevent things from going, you know, really being destabilized, or there's that uh, threshold effect. So stable for a while, but definitely a risk of, of seeing da dangerous effects. Now look at how that changes over the entire spectrum. On the dismissive side, people are, I mean, overwhelmingly concerned, um, convinced that either the Earth's climate is absolutely stable or it's random. Either one of those basically suggests that you shouldn't do anything about it. Right? You can see the, the clear pattern here. I wonder if we did that kind of question in Seychelles. Where do you think people come down on? at least a very interesting uh, possible explanation for what's going on behind what seems like people are. Here's another one. If I ask you, what emotions would you expect if someone didn't care? What, what emotional response do you expect? They're just not interested or they're distracted or what? Well, look at how Americans feel about um, global warming. More than six in 10 Americans are actually very interested in it. <laughs> very interested or moderately at least. 64%. Um, 46% say they're afraid. Now, if you don't care, you're not afraid. <laughs> Some of them are outraged. Again, there's actually intense emotional engagement. 
similar about the word angry. I'm not sure what the difference um, was in the in the way that the question was asked. But more than half of them feel helpless. Now it's not a very comfortable feeling. Um, we'll spend a lot more time on the emotional responses. But just think about that. They just feel helpless. They don't not care. They don't know what to do. And 50% are disgusted. Again, a rather strong emotional involvement in the issue. You must pay attention to it for you to get disgusted. But it's not something you want to hang out with. <laughs> if you're disgusted, you're going to change the channel. You're going to, you know, go out and, I don't know, go to the beach. <laughs> Or when you're ashamed or guilty or, you know, those kinds of experiences, you would much rather not spend any time with that. Um, only 41% or so in this particular instance feel hopeful. Now that's interesting, right? Again, not uh, an emotion you would expect when someone doesn't care, but it's not the majority either. So we're going to spend a good deal of time on how to create hope in people. But again, what I want to suggest to you is this is not the profile of a public or even six Americas that doesn't care. What if people actually were deeply engaged, but they don't just see change coming, climate change, but loss? Here's a long list of the kinds of losses that climate change involves. Loss of health, life, home, livelihood, a sense of connection to the places where we live or connection to each other, loss of species that we care about or biodiversity, habitats, landscapes, loss of seasons. That may not be as much of an issue for you, <laughs> but there are some, right? Differences that you recognize and people count on and it's part of what the, our place and our landscapes are like. Loss of life support systems, a sense of security. We all can relate to that right now, what that's like. Even the loss of certainty that there will be a future that will be well, that we can trust that there will be, you know, a future for us to live in. And possibly also a loss of who we think we are as humans, or if the changes involve a change in our livelihood, you know, you think you're a fisherman, you think you're um, a doctor, and maybe there is a change to that identity and overall possibly a loss of hope. So what if part of what's going on is not that people don't care, but they care a ton about all these things. And in fact, here you see it. This is over all these years that uh, Tony and his colleagues have done this study, the worry about climate change has gone up quite steadily. Clearly variations from year to year but overall, there's definitely um, an increase, and you see particularly uh, an increase in the proportion of people who are very worried. In other words, they did pay attention. They just got really scared. So what if people actually cared a lot and that this issue is threatening everything that they love and have, everything that they depend on for their life and livelihood to their offspring, to themselves in the future, to their identities. What if that's what's going on? And if that's true, then what do we need to do to bring them back into the conversation? I wanna to show to you um, a very simplified response that we seem to have to existential threats, like I just described. And it's simply this. We either reduce the threat or we reduce the feelings about the threat. If there is a threat that we can do something about, we will do it. That's one, one very clear thing we know from human beings. We don't just sit by and let the you know, lion eat us. <laughs> we will run, we will do something, we will protect ourselves. Or look at the COVID response, right? We are mobilizing everything we know of how to reduce the threat to this particular um, uh, issue that, that's arising to the virus. When we don't know what we do, how to reduce that threat, it is unbearable to keep looking it in the face. 
and we will flip the channel. We will numb out, we will go away. And you see that very simply in, I'll show you two images to, to, um, to convey that to you. Greta Thunberg, um, a Swedish a student and activist who's become very famous, I probably don't need to introduce you to her. She said, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic and act as if the house was on fire. And in fact, the quote goes on, because it is, right? She is very much about reduce the threat people. Don't just, you know, sit here doing nothing. There's a whole bunch of other people and many in certainly the American government and in many other countries um, will spend endless amount of times avoiding the dealing with the threat and they will distract you from it by whatever they can find, focusing on some stupid email scandal or focusing on, you know, lies and calling it a hoax or whatever it is. Meanwhile, that train is still coming, right? So those are the two very basic responses we have to existential threats. So obviously what we're here trying to do is getting people to actually act on the threat rather than just helping them avoid the feeling about the threat. So I'm gonna ask you here to stop this exercise and um, stop this video and turn to, again, your conversation partner. Um, contact them, you will find the instructions in the Google folder and discuss with them this particular issue. What do you think is going on? And I want you to think about that for the Seychelles in your own experience. Is it that people are just distracted? Is it that they simply don't see anybody else acting on it and so why should they? Or do they feel like they have no power, no influence on the process? Or do they hold worldviews that simply make them feel like they can't or they shouldn't? They don't need to act on climate change. Or is there maybe something going on where it's actually feeling to them like an existential threat that they don't know how to address? And so they shut down and turn away and, or maybe even debate the issue but not engage constructively. I want you to discuss it with each other and take notes on it and, and come back to this to our Zoom meeting um, to see how, how you were thinking about that and what you observe. I'm so curious, I can't wait to, to hear. When you're back from that exercise, I want to say a little bit more about, you know, what I just mentioned to you, all these five hypotheses, they're actually true about any issue, but what's special about communicating climate change? Is there something um, here that we maybe in addition have to do? When it comes to communicating climate science, um, it's actually pretty difficult to convey. <laughs> it's not that simple because it's this global, invisible, complex issue and, you know, it's challenging to do. Daniel gave us a good example of how to make that happen, but it's it's not easy. Um, climate scientists are often not trained communicators, but they were the first ones to notice the issue and they were the ones leading the communication. And so they led with information. They led with, you know, what they thought was essential for us to all understand. Um, oftentimes, the a scientist's most important currency is that they stay with the credible knowledge. And that means that they front load uncertainty and they hedge their bets and they don't talk about the solutions and they don't you know, wanna basically get into any uh, territory that's emotional or whatever, the passions around this whole issue. So they will just stick to the climate science. And you have to remember for a scientist, information and learning and understanding, that's their daily life. That's their, that's their identity. It's very important to them. But to many, many lay people, it is not. <laughs> it's just simply not. It's not the most important thing. The other thing, because of that, and comes direct out, directly out of this assumption that many scientists hold, um, that information is important, many scientists believe that if people only understood what I understand about this issue, they would act. It's what we call the information deficit model. This assumption that our audience must have a hole in their brains. <laughs> they do not have the full information about the issue. And because 
they don't have the information, they simply cannot act. Well, I have to tell you one thing. The information deficit model has been proven wrong again and again and again and again. And climate scientists continue to act from that place. So it is still a prevailing mode of science communication that we think it is about the delivery of information from which then by some miracle, automatically the right behavior change and, and policy response occurs. It is not true. This will not happen. It helps to know information, absolutely. I'm not at all countering that it's beneficial for many of us to understand climate change. If we did, we wouldn't be so vulnerable maybe to counter arguments, but it is not in essential. It is not a necessary precondition for people to take the right action. Very important. What about mitigating? Communicating mitigation, the reduction of emissions, reducing the causes, or sometimes as I call it, reducing the front end of the problem. Well, here in America, at least, when you ask them, you know, what do you actually know about how to do that? People basically shut up in like two seconds. <laughs> they do not have the technical, um, you know, know-how of what it takes to reduce it. Um, for most people talking about mitigation, about greenhouse gas reductions is a political thing and blah, they don't want to talk about the political stuff. Um, they, you know, view themselves and, and simply are uh, embedded in energy system, transportation systems, in food systems that are beyond people's control. Like you ask them to change their food habits and yet, you know, they're embedded in families that eat a certain way and cultures that eat a certain way. Uh, embedded in, you know, food coming in from long distance, like it is in your country. Um, and many, many people don't understand that it actually requires all of us to act together to make this work. So, you know, you've heard it many times. Well, what if small Seychelles were to act on climate change? What difference does it make? In some ways, there it's a very good argument, right? If Seychelles was the only country in the world to act on the issue, it would not make much of a difference. So how do you convince people that their action contributes to collective effectiveness? And even if you were to convince them, making that change, changing your family's habits, your own habits, oh my God, look at how extremely difficult that is right now where we are under a crisis of a pandemic, asked all of a sudden to do trainings online, to do you know, all our meetings online, all our work online, while we're also taking care of our kids and families and are, you know, worried out of our brains with what's going on health-wise. So this is actually really, really challenging. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that the way the solutions are communicated is often very difficult for people to understand how um, an action relates causally to make a difference to the global problem. And they simply don't know how to make that change. So if you just tell people, you know, put solar panels on your roof, you know how many steps it takes from having no solar panels to having them? It's a huge challenge to make that happen. If you tell people, oh, don't use, you know, private transportation, use public transportation. What if they go outside and there isn't a bus? <laughs> right? It takes actually a lot of work to make your personal change happen. We're going to spend a good time, a deal of time thinking about the barriers to change like that and how that can actually change our communication approach very uh, substantially. So one of the things I like to say, and I'm going to say it many times, and I want you to, if there's nothing else that you take away from this training, take away this one sentence. I want you to talk to people about how social change happens more than telling them how climate change happens. <laughs> I'm gonna say that again and again. People do not know how to make change. If you give them a good enough reason and you show them how to make the change, how their action contributes to helping with the bigger issue, I will guarantee you, you will get a lot further 
with having an impact than if you simply explain to them a thousand times over how climate change works. Teach social change more than climate change. I love climate change understanding. Don't get me wrong. I want you to educate whoever you can about that issue, but do not do that without also telling them how they can help with making the social change happen. That is so much more important. We will spend a good day on that. Finally, on the communicating of impacts and adaptation. So you might see that and have experienced that when you did that exercise too, um, on going outside in your neighborhood, maybe you didn't see anything immediately. Um, some of the risks that we're expecting with climate change, they aren't local or severe enough yet for you to see. And so, you know, people don't see it while well, it ain't happening here. <laughs> it's not happening yet. Um, and it's very challenging um, for them to understand how threatening that actually is. It's interesting, there are findings from the research literature that suggests when we think about an issue globally, we can actually recognize and feel the existential threat. But in the local environment, in, with which we are familiar, if it's not right in our face, and if we have experienced it, we've seen that shoreline eroding, we've seen, you know, this whatever landslides, of, oh, it's more familiar. And things that are familiar with, we, that we're familiar with, we just don't view as existential threats in the same way. So it's really interesting, right? At the global level, we can perceive it, but at the local level, it's much harder. So challenging issue for communicating impacts and adaptation. But when they do come home, and I wonder, I'm looking forward to hearing about your own experience, when you let it in, what it means, you might have a pretty intense emotional response to it. And in fact, that's what we see with lots of people. You know, when the storm impacts hits them, when the hunger comes right here, when the drought takes away their cattle, whatever, it, whatever the issue is, when you know the, the fish stocks get depleted or the corals bleach, I mean, you, you might have direct experience of all of that and how you felt about that. Many of us have very strict interpretive lenses on, if you will, glasses through which we look at it, and that might very well um, influence how we interpret what's happening. Um, many people, at least in this country, I wonder how it is in Seychelles, when the minute you talk to them about the causation that we humans have contributed to this, they just turn off. It's like, no, no, no. no. And why? Mostly because if um, they're actually part of the, you know, at fault for this, if you will, people start feeling guilty and who wants to feel guilty? <laughs> it's a very hard conversation. Um, oftentimes when we talk about communication of impacts and adaptation, we're only hearing it from scientists or from people far away, not from the locals who actually are experiencing it and, and experience the impacts firsthand. So we need the trusted messengers really, um, the adaptation language, you know, uh, you saw it in, in Daniel's uh, presentation, he used mitigation and adaptation and all kinds of other jargon. And um, for most people, that's totally unfamiliar, um, that language. It doesn't resonate, it doesn't touch them. It's really not a good start starter for the conversation. Um, for many local officials, it's, it's really difficult to address and, and open a conversation about adaptation because this is where they live. This is who elected them. And they need to ask people to change and make maybe difficult choices. Ah, people don't like that. <laughs> Local officials don't like it. Um, and then, in, at least in this country, there's actually organized resistance against taking local adaptation effort. Not only, but that the, in some instances, that can make things um, even more challenging. So, what we know then is one part of getting people to. Um, begin to take this seriously is if they have, if you will, five gateway beliefs, you know, the things that if they don't believe those things, they tend to not be able to get on board with action. One is that they have to understand that the climate change is real and that we humans have caused it and that scientists agree on those two facts. That's an important issue because that establishes that there is a risk and that there is a problem. 
They also need to understand that those impacts from climate change are serious now and will be even more serious in the future. And then the last one is that they can actually do something about it, that those impacts can be reduced and that we, we all together can make a difference in shaping the future. If people don't have a sense that they can do something about the future, remember what they do? They don't want to sit with the uncomfortable feeling of you know, creating a future that's unbearable. So they turn off. So these are crucial pieces of what people need to get. But they don't all come to this from the same place. You know? So where are the, the uh, six Americas equivalent uh, in, in your society, in your country? Let me turn then to just a very basic overview of um, the keys to behavior and social change. What's the fundamental approach? And it won't take just a few more minutes to lay that um, and then we'll conclude for today. If you want people to act on what they know, to walk their talk, if you will, we need to help them through our communication strategy to connect the talk to walk. But as this image is trying to convey, that connection between communication and behavior change is not an easy passage. Many things can go wrong between how you communicate, to whom, in what channels, whatever, before you get anyone to take, you know, whatever step it is that you want them to take. So that's that's our challenge, to make that passage, if you will, across. And so here is a formula um, that I'm going to use throughout the rest of this uh, training. For communication to be effective, that is, to actually achieve the goal you want to see, the desired social change you want to see, it must do a few things. The first one is it must sufficiently elevate and maintain, important, maintain the motivation to make a change, wherever that is, in your personal practice or in policy, and it must contribute to lowering the barriers and or resistance to doing so. So think about it in this string here that you see at the bottom. Communication needs to elevate motivation and re reduce the barriers and resistance to achieve the social change. There are many, many different theories out there of how to, to do that, um, different ways to combine these elements. I weeded through them in a book that I edited um, 15 something years ago and this is still the basics. <laughs> you know, it's it's rougher. It's it. We're going to deal with each part of it, but essentially, this balance of elevating motivation, giving people reason to act, and then reducing anything that might get in the way is what we need to achieve. I talk about that in uh, a short and a longer interview, and you see the links here at the bottom. So if you are interested. You can go and explore that in some depth. Um, I'll explain it more there. So what we're going to work through in this training through the rest of these units is basically, you know, how to break down that communication to motivation to overcoming barriers to social change. Um, and it begins with identifying and getting to know our audiences and then defining what you want to achieve. What is it that you're aiming for? Um, and then framing that issue in ways that people are really interested and want to hear it and can understand it, finding the right messengers and appropriate channels and venues for the communication, and then putting in a lot of empowerment um, to, and, and helping people to act on the information that you give them, right? And, and at the same time, sort of look at these barriers and see how can you take barriers away. And sometimes when you do that, you realize, my God, the barriers they are facing, they can't address that. And you know, I need to talk to someone completely different to address that barrier. And if we address it, everybody will be able to act on their motivation. So that's how you know you then go back to the audience and the goals and and how to frame it to that audience that <laughs> you had in mind. So it's really repeating, iterating, following up, and deepening with people, maintaining that that motivation, um, helping them overcome those barriers. It's a lot more than communication, isn't it? And then, of course, also reviewing and evaluating, did it work? What can you learn from that 
um, to improve your own approach to the issue. This is how this is, this is what we're mostly going to focus on, but let me show you how we're going to break that down um, in the coming issues. And as I said, it's, it's basically an iterative approach to it. In unit two, we will focus on the audience, your goals, and some key messages. In unit three, we're going to go deeper on the audience and looking at their motivations and values, concerns, and barriers that they're facing, and some of the offenses that they might have, finding resonant frames for them, and addressing their emotional, um, you know, maybe resistance, defenses, or also positive emotions that might actually add to the motivation um, that makes it empowering for them to act on what you're saying. Um, we're in unit four, we're going to look at uh, four. We're going to look at the influential messengers and the appropriate channels and venues for communication. And then I'm going to have you report out on that um, in the last unit, and we're going to spend time on thinking about how would we know that it worked. So that's the overview of how our um, the rest of our uh, training works. So just to reiterate, communication is a lot more than delivering information. It's about connecting to people on all those different levels. Um, you have to address the issues that, you know, that we talked about, whether it's worldviews, whether it's their emotional responses, whether it's their sense of having, having, making a difference, um, all those things need to be addressed. So it's way more than just an issue of people don't get it in their heads. It's not about just they don't understand. They might have very deep psychological, social, cultural, political reasons for why they don't. And so that's where it becomes a strategic approach to communication. We must address that and we can. Um, so, you know, this fundamental approach of elevating motivation and lowering the barriers, that is what the heart of this, this communication training is about. And I'm going to walk you through it. In the supplementary materials online, I'm going to have more information for you on the science impacts and solutions for those of you who want that and need that. Um, and I'm going to have something on the Fundamentals on Communicating Climate Change, videos that are, give examples or short presentations on the basics, um, some short readings, um, and for those of you who are interested, even some very accessibly written scientific papers. So explore those at your leisure. Um, hopefully it'll help you, you know, take in what we've done so far. Of course, you can always look at this again. Quick outlook to you, um, which is next week. Um, first of all, I want to repeat it. Just adhere to all the guidelines about social distancing, physical distancing, but social connecting in virtual ways. OK, um, we can you do that with your partner. And if you have questions for me or Michelle, contact us by um, by email um, or messaging or whatever it is and let us know. But please stay safe um, as you process. Take down questions, challenges, issues, concerns, anything you have so that we can discuss it in our Zoom meeting and be, you know, ready to, to, to share them and, and let us know. So very important for you to be a hermit crab <laughs> and do this virtually. Um, what we'll do in the Zoom meeting is discuss basically um, anything that came up in exercises one, two and three. Um, obviously, we'll get to know each other a little bit and, and then focus on the questions and concerns and whether that's logistics or content that you might have had. OK. In unit two, as I said, we'll focus on figuring out the audience and getting to know the audience and then what you want to achieve with them and what you might want to say. And for this, um, for these messages, I actually want you to draw on what you learned in Daniel Tango's lectures, what you experienced yourself when you went outside and looked at what's happening in your neighborhood. We'll do exercises. We have Patsy um, give us a perspective on communication change. And as I said, send us your questions. Here's my email. Um, uh, I already gave you Michelle's. So I think it's going to be uh, and great conversation and uh, I look forward